Welcome to my world, the world of Halo 2. In my opinion, the best Halo out there. And by the end of this video, I think you're going to agree with me. In this video, I'm gonna give you everything you could ever want in relation to tricks, glitches, and mechanics for H2. Sit back, relax, and prepare to have your mind turned inside out. Because some of the shit I'm covering today, I haven't even seen before. That's how rare some of these glitches are. First up, weapons glitches. You can use this combination of button inputs with quite a few different weapons, but the BR is the most common, so let's just go with that. The BXR. Basically, all this is is a melee and animation cancel and then instantly being able to shoot. Now this does require you to be on standard controls for it to actually be a BXR, but just to be thorough, it's melee, action reload, shoot. This is used in multiplayer the most, but it's an insane play in tight situations. Now for RRX. This is the double shot. Actually doing the timing of a double shot on a controller is much harder than it sounds, because if you push the buttons too fast or too slow, you'll just shoot and then force a reload. This is also only a multiplayer trick and is mostly used by old pros or idiots that just can't double shot and instead decide to use a programmed controller. Dog shit. Either way, this can get you out of almost any situation that's multiplayer related, if you are good enough. Another weapons glitch that really isn't too much of an actual glitch, but it's rather just helpful for quick weapon swapping, is simply just YY. It allows you to switch weapons back and forth very fast, which is very helpful. The last basic weapons button glitch is the RRY. And as dumb as this sounds, this allows you to shoot yourself in the back. The funny thing here is that this is one of the old ways people used to be killed by the Guardians back in 04. It's not too useful today in very many circumstances, I can actually only think of one off the top of my head, but nonetheless it's hilarious to show this to people that don't know about it and then they freak out because they don't understand what just happened. On the subject of shooting, did you know that there is actually glass that you can shoot through on Oracle and Sacred Icon? Not all glass can be shot through, but in the Deathless run, shooting through the floor on the SI elevator to kill the Enforcer is not only fast, but safe too. Something else worth mentioning that is absolutely hilarious is the holding LT weapons glitch, or left trigger. Basically, all it does is make your character model point the gun down at the ground, but when you shoot while holding LT, the bullet comes out of the end of the weapon and goes straight ahead instead of to the floor. It looks really bizarre and oftentimes scares the shit out of unsuspecting people in multiplayer. This next glitch is a classic, triple wielding. It's basically LT, hold Y, spam Y. That's on standard controls and the timing is super tight, but for everyone that's not on standard controls, it's throw a grenade, hold weapon swap briefly, then spam weapon swap. And when done correctly, you can hold three weapons at the same time. Side note, this only works for dual wieldable weapons, so just kind of an FYI. Also notable is that there are overloaded weapons hidden throughout the campaign. Most often these are either carbines or BRs, but the base stock of a carbine is 72 and a BR is 108. There are weapons on Cairo, Sacred Icon, Quarantine Zone, and Gravemind uh, just off the top of my head that are hidden as nice little Easter eggs. Can you find them? Up next isn't exactly a glitch, but it's worth mention. Different weapons do different amounts of damage. For example, the rocket launcher and the root shot do more damage than the BR or SMG. The way to prove this is to simply walk over to another player that is full shield and jump and melee them. With heavier weapons, you can actually get a one-hit KO. This is what players have done in Capture the Flag and Oddball for years. Different weapons also have different effects on the ways enemies react to the player. For example, if you have out a sword and are in close proximity to an enemy, they are more likely to run toward you and try to melee you. If they are far away, they will shoot you and retreat. Another example is the beam rifle and the needler. Both of these weapons are considered, you know, quote unquote, scary. <coughs> the best proof of this can be shown on Gravemind doing prison skip on easy mode. The brutes in this area don't like to cooperate, but when you switch to a beam rifle or a needler, they immediately punch you, and that's exactly what we need to make prison skip work. Secondly, let's talk about some more complicated weapons glitches. I'll start us off with the double nade throw. This glitch can only be done with weapons that can overheat, so the beam rifle, plasma rifle, and plasma pistol respectively. Plasma pistol is by far the easiest. Basically, when you shoot an overcharged shot of the plasma pistol, your character model does an animation that you can abuse. If you look at the bar or the top of the plasma pistol, 
you can see after firing it, a cooldown timer will appear. That timer is your visual cue. If you think of it as a uh, clock, once the time is at about 4.30, that's when you want to throw your grenade. If you press grenade throw twice, you can get two grenades in. What is happening is that right as the cooldown hits that point, your character is doing an animation. And if you throw the grenade at that time, you can interrupt the animation, and that's what allows you to throw the second grenade. Another funny glitch with grenades happens mostly on lasso just because the enemies have so much health, but if you stick them, they have a chance of dropping their weapon and becoming weaponless. What makes this happen is because the AI is programmed to react to the player. So when they get stuck by a grenade, they think they're going to die. They go into what I like to call melee mode, where their AI is effectively broken and all they want to do is path toward the player, if they can see you. This is super worth experimenting with if you want to get that lasso achievement. Now let me take you back briefly to the BXR that was mentioned earlier. Instead of using a BR, if you use a shotgun and add a jump input on the end of that BXR, you can get what's called a shoddy boost. This is a must have in easy mode speedruns. The combination on standard controls is BXRA, and what you're doing is meleeing at an enemy, killing them, and keeping the momentum from the lunge going while adding a jump on the end to get further distance. Using this correctly throughout a speedrun can save minutes upon minutes. Following this is melee canceling. This can be used in a few different ways, so let's do the basic one first. This is a speedrun mechanic. You can use a couple of different combinations of inputs on your controller, but I'll just explain the one that I'm the most comfortable with. The jump, crouch, BYA, jump method. Sounds complex, I know. Just wait till we get to butterflying. Okay, so breaking this down, you jump toward an enemy and aim slightly over their head. Once you're close enough, you wanna melee, then hold crouch, swap weapons, and then jump again. What is happening is that you have a decent size melee range even when you're aiming above the target. You are purposely trying to go over their head and that's the part that the crouch helps with. The weapon swap cancels the melee attack from actually trying to connect to the enemy. And then the second jump lets you jump off of the enemy's head. This will send you flying past the enemy. On the other hand, this is not the only way a melee cancel can be useful. A perfect example is on Cairo Station right at the very start, tram skip. To simplify, you're betraying allies to make them enemies so you can melee the lunge off. But basically, you're just trying to get past an invisible barrier. You punch a marine into a specific spot and then simply you just BYB or BXB, either works. This allows you to skip the first half of the mission and save almost a minute in time. Mastery of this changed the speed run forever. Now for the complicated one, butterflying. The easiest way to explain this is that you are piloting an enemy using melee canceling. I'm gonna make a full in-depth tutorial on every aspect of this trick, but for the sake of this video, I'll explain just the basics. You can find this mostly used on high charity to skip the entire mission. You lure a flood to the edge of the map and shoot his arm off while he is running to you. This stops him from shooting you and allows for you to melee chain him into a dead zone. A dead zone is just a spot on the map where the AI doesn't have the ability to path. Pretty much, if the AI can't shoot you and they can't path to you, they just stand there. That's what makes this consistent. You use the melee chain to make him continue to melee and lure him into this area. Up next, you push him close to the edge of the map and walk off while looking up at the enemy and then start a BY spam to catch and pull him off onto your head. Once he's on your head, you start the rhythm of BYA, which is melee, weapon swap, jump. I know you are wondering how you can just jump off of midair. My theory is that because the enemy is standing on your head, he is connected to you, and the game thinks that because he's standing on you and is connected to you that your feet are actually touching some sort of surface, and that's what allows you to jump even though there's no ground under you. Butterflying is most of the time done backwards, as that is the way where it seems like you have the least resistance from the enemy and can move the fastest. Once you're at the desired spot to start dropping into the end level trigger, you do a BY spam and try to maintain looking at the flood if you are going too fast so you can catch him. Once you get that stop, then you can simply do a melee cancel, which is just BY under the enemy and drop into the end level trigger. Now, disclaimer here. This is an oversimplification of this trick. 
Another video way more in depth is still to come. Stay tuned. To piggyback off of the BY spam used in butterflying, you can actually levitate forever above an enemy that is standing still. You simply hold down on the left stick so you're looking at the enemy, and you spam BYA on standard controls. This gives you an infinite loop of meleeing and canceling. The melee is literally allowing you to levitate. Okay, let's switch things up a bit and go over some sword glitches. Sword canceling and sword flying. Obviously, you need the sword for this, and sword canceling is very similar to melee canceling, but instead you use right trigger or whatever button you would use to do the main sword attack. You still wanna aim near the top of the enemy, as well as crouch, but with the velocity that comes off of sword lunges, you can go sailing off into the distance pretty easily. This brings up a nice little glitch at the end of the Arbiter called Glass Clip. Using some hitbox displacement, uh, more on this later, uh, you can sword lunge through glass. This is just one of the many ways the sword is the go-to weapon in campaign. And now for the most used glitch in Halo 2, sword flying. The button combination is YXR. How this works is you take whatever weapon you have and get a red reticle. Once you have that red reticle, you swap weapons, cancel the animation swap, and then sword lunge. When done correctly, you are tricking the game into thinking that the sword can actually do a standard sword attack from any distance that you can get a red reticle with. This is a three frame trick. So as long as all the buttons are not hit on the exact same frame, then the fly will work. Where things get complicated is when the frame rate of the games is really, really high. This makes sword flying way harder. Basically, the more frames that pass per second, the less time you have to do the inputs correctly. This does take some practice to get down, so my advice would be to load up off host with a friend, because there you'll have a little bit of input delay or lag, and that will make things a little easier. The Swordfly is used in just about every mission of Halo 2 speedrunning, and is a staple of the run itself. But just to break that down a little bit more, YXR is simply just the start of sword flying. There are a lot of other sword flies in the midst of this mechanic. For example, if you YXR A, which is, you know, you sword fly and then you jump, you can actually jump off of the air and go flying way past an enemy. There's also the forced mid-air stop sword fly, which is you YXR A and then look away from the enemy and you can force the game to stop you above the enemy. And then there is also the YXR, which is, it's kind of the basic one, but instead of just flying to the enemy, if you YX and then hold R, you can kill the enemy. And that way you don't have to deal with them once you get there. The most complicated of the sword flies is the YXR Hold X, which is only seen at the end of Cairo Station. And what you're doing is you're positioning a plasma pistol, and then you're sword flying off of an enemy, grabbing the plasma pistol mid-fly, and then jumping over the enemy, so that way you can take a plasma pistol or a noob combo into the final room of Cairo Station. Sword flying is insane. Let's move on to glitches with the character model. First up is the tantrum. Make this simple, this is literally just jumping over and over again on a flat surface until you stand on air. Sounds made up, right? Yeah, I know, but trust me when I say, it's real. To break it down and explain what's happening, your character model has a standard idle animation. Like if you just stand there and don't touch your controller, your character will give the impression of breathing. This is where the glitch comes in. If you jump and at the peak of your jump, your character model is finishing that idle animation, the game restores your hitbox to its base position and that will lock you in place even if there is no ground under you. The best spot I can show this off is on Uprising at the start. There is a ledge that you just can't normally get to. And because you don't start with grenades, this is the perfect spot for this. Check it out. And the reason why is uh, I like to know how long this takes in real time. There was the tantrum, by the way. Moving on to the Dead Alive glitch. The Dead Alive glitch is simply spawning in a teammate as a dead body. How this works depends on some very specific things happening in the code to force your co-op partner to return as a body instead of a player. Um, but the best instance of this is on Oracle in the elevator section at the very beginning. 
Basically, you gotta, you know, you kill your teammate and you delay their spawn. You line up in a specific spot and they spawn in as a dead alive body if you've done everything correctly. Why this is important is because the elevator, you know, you have to fight stuff. It's, it's like a two and a half minute waiting period. And you can't just skip it normally because there's a death barrier underneath. But if you spawn in your teammate as a dead body, even though, I mean, it is a dead body, but they're alive at the same time, they can pass through the death barrier and successfully skip the elevator. Uh, it's, it's actually pretty nuts. I'll have a little bit more on this later though. Up next, the pressure launch. One of the best tricks in Halo 2 Anniversary. This is used on Oracle to make yourself invincible for the entire back half of the mission. The pressure launch itself is simple. You just press the button on the elevator, and as it goes up, you press it again and walk under the elevator. When it comes back down, you go through it instead of getting crushed, and you get launched really, really high. Where the invincibility comes from is that Bungie coded the player to be invincible during the elevator ride up. Why? I don't know, but they did. The player is supposed to lose that invincibility once the elevator docks at the top where the cables are. But if the elevator never reaches the top, then the invincibility never goes away. This glitch literally made Oracle one of the easiest levels to beat on Legendary. I want to make a note here because this glitch is so rare that I couldn't even find footage of it and it's literally never happened to me, but there is a potential soft lock on Oracle where if one of the sentinels in the cable cut room breaks a cable while the player is on the way up the elevator shaft, your game literally gets soft locked. Since the platform actually moves after each cable cut, if this happens before you reach the top, the elevator keeps just going straight up, but you go up to nowhere. The only proof of this I have comes from Mr. Monopoly himself. Maybe one day someone else can get lucky enough to experience this. On the topic of launches, I'd like to bring to your attention the gravity jump at the end of Quarantine Zone. It's fairly simple, all you're doing is jumping three times based on a visual cue, but why this works is what makes it so good. So this gondola is moving at a very high rate of speed. You don't really notice because it's so big, but you're really ah! hard. The glitch is at the top of the elevator. Getting up there is really easy, you just walk around and walk up a slant and you're up there. And You know, because you're near the outer edges of the gondola, so to speak, you can abuse the physics of the high rate of speed and capitalize with an insane launch to the end of the mission. Another launch is on regret. This one took years for people to understand. I call it the slingshot launch because it's almost like you're getting ricocheted off the gondola. How this works is by overlapping triggers in the game that are never supposed to overlap. And without going into too much detail, you essentially are making the gondolas be in two different places at the same time. Using a despawn trick by constantly meleeing to make the game think you're in combat, at least that's my theory, you can push a trigger timing to happen on top of another trigger. Basically, these triggers make the gondola travel to and from the towers, and when you overlap them, the game doesn't know what to do. So you start seeing the gondolas disappear and reappear over and over. How this gets fixed is by progressing the script, which in this case is literally just killing the enemies based on an audio cue. Now, this is a little more complicated than I'm letting on, but you make those two different scripts correct or finish at the same time. And while that's happening, you need to be in a very specific position on top of the gondola. Once those scripts finish, the game will make the correction, so to speak, and the gondolas instantly teleport to their intended positions, and that's what flings Chief to Narnia. Literally, you can hit the edge of the map, and if that wasn't there, to be honest, I really don't know how far you'd go. Let's shift now over to another glitch called Super Bouncing. This glitch is specific to tick rate and frame rate. You can mod MCC to make this work, but for the most part, this is a classic only glitch, which means you would need the original game in either an Xbox 360 or an OG Xbox, either or. Super Bouncing happens when your hitbox is displaced and you land in between where polygons connect. This is only the tip of the iceberg though. In order to get displacement that works for super bouncing, you need to find a part of the wall that extends so you can crouch under the edge of it. Once crouched, you let go of crouch, and what happens is your character tries to stand up but can't because of the wall above you. This is the displacement you need. Once crouched, you simply run and jump off of the desired edge to get the desired bounce. Side note, once you get uncrouched from the wall, don't stop moving. Constant movement is what keeps your hitbox displaced. The second part of this trick is based on how high you jump from and the velocity of character movement while falling. Not every bounce is the same, it's not that simple. Some bounces, you can simply 
just jump off and free fall to the desired location. Other bounces you need to hold forward the whole time or hold forward right until you land, and sometimes you have to free fall and then hold forward at the end. It takes a lot of experience to be able to tell what needs to happen and where. The beautiful thing about super bouncing is that you can literally bounce anywhere that two polygons connect. The easiest way to tell this is by just looking at the ground. All of the textures back then were pretty low quality, so finding bounce spots is easy. On the complete opposite side, we have debouncing. The only difference here is that debouncing sends you through the ground and into void space. Or, I guess, if there was a room below you, you could debounce into that room. How this happens is when you are too perfectly centered in between the polygons you're trying to land on. Because your hitbox is offset, you just slide right through the ground. This is super unlikely most of the time, but of course, in a deathless run, the worst always happens. Check out this regret clip. That one I need, I think I need to be more to the right. I think I know what to do. I'm here, like this. Why are we still here? Just to suffer? Ghosting is the next topic of Hitbox Offset. This is also a classic only glitch, and if you're familiar with any type of run and campaign, you've seen this on Cairo Station. The difference here between ghosting and super bouncing is that for super bouncing, you need displacement upward, which is why you get the displacement by crouching. For ghosting, you need displacement behind you. How you achieve this is by bumping into certain objects a specific amount of times. This will generate what we like to call screen shakes. It's subtle to the untrained eye, but tracking screen shakes is how you know when you're ready to phase through the wall. Now this doesn't work on every wall. You can't just skip everything and phase through the wall. There are some pretty specific circumstances to make this work. The wall has to be fairly thin and you also have to have a solid stable object in order to actually displace your hitbox. All in all, there's still a lot to learn with ghosting, even though runners have known about it for years. It feels like the more time that goes by, the more questions we seem to have. Ah! Clip that. I just ghosted through the floor. All right. Here comes the baw! Okay, I know that was stupid. All right, it's breaking all walls, baw. This glitch is used pretty much only in custom games, but all you're doing is stacking up so many grenades next to each other that you're almost getting teleported when they explode. You can get anywhere from 10 to 30 grenades into a pile, depending on the desired wall you wanna break. It's simple. You stack the nades and throw one behind the big pile. Once they hit you, you go through walls. And speaking of walls, I know you've heard of the term head glitching. That's our next big trick. All you do is hold forward into any wall that is either 90 degrees or is acute. This works for both Chief and Arbiter. Why this works, I'm glad you asked. The enemies in Halo 2 determine where the player is based on where your head is located. They can't actually see your body. So if you put your head inside of a wall or void space, they will only know wherever your last position was, wherever they last saw you. The other side of head glitching is lefty peeking corners. Your character hitbox offsets to the right, so you can peek around left corners to shoot enemies and they will not be able to see you. This works in multiplayer as well as campaign. Then we have corner riding, one of my favorites. Once again, a classic only trick. Yeah, I know, 343 broke Halo, what's new? Corner riding only works on obtuse angles or perfect 90 degree angles. The only real good example worth mentioning is on Uprising. At the very start of the mission, you can slide all the way down to the water. How this works is by riding down the corner, back and forth over where the polygons of the wall connect. By holding forward into the wall and moving back and forth over the corner, you clip your character model inside the wall and slow yourself down. This will repeatedly reset your fall timer. Man, Classic was the best. You will never guess what comes next. ICG, 
or the infinite camo glitch. Yet another classic only glitch lost to time. This glitch gives you permanent invisibility. Yes, permanent. This requires the Envy Skull from Delta Halo and a checkpoint. You activate camo and while camoed, get a checkpoint. Start, save, and quit, and then hard reset your console. The hard reset removes Envy from being active, as back then there was no menu to turn skulls on and off. What's going on is that the game knows that you reset the console, so it takes away the Envy Skull, but it forgets that you had Envy during the checkpoint. Thus, when you load back up your recent save, you will be permanently invisible. I know you're gonna have some fun with this one. And this save and quit glitch brings me to the only other glitch that I have never personally encountered. Normally I like to get all the footage myself, but this glitch is so rare, I only know of one video of its existence, period. It's called Anakade's Blast Door, as he was the first one to encounter this. This blast door should not be here under any circumstances, yet here it is. Mr. Monopoly has been experimenting with how and why this works, and we've discussed a bit about map-based states and loading up between levels. The theory right now is that during the end of a mission, the next level is already starting to load. This prevents the waiting time in between. Where the glitch happens, we think, is that if you save and quit near the end of the level, just before the next level is properly loaded, that's how this glitch can happen. Beyond that, it's all just guessing. Have you ever seen this? Let me know in the comments. Onward to vehicle glitches. If I told you that there was a Warthog on Cairo, you'd probably laugh at me. Well, here it is. Getting this thing to spawn is a giant pain in the ass, but it's here and we love it. I don't think this is gonna work, but we're doing it. So here we go. Let me make sure I can get this. Oh, okay, hold on. Let's go first try. First try, let's go. Another warthog worth mentioning is on outskirts. There's a hidden hog that is literally invincible. No matter what, this thing can't be destroyed. So let's see if it can withstand the scarab gun. Here we go. Oh yeah, the invincible warthog, we're still in there. Now that's what I'm talking about. Metropolis. This has an interesting vehicle glitch using a banshee from the bridge area. This basically only works on easy mode because you have to lure a banshee all the way through the tunnel and that doesn't really work on legendary. You lure the banshee into the tube that leads to the dome section. Right as the banshee is sitting on the load zone, you hijack it and boost forward. If done correctly, you can now fly the banshee to the end of the mission. Nade boarding, such a useful mechanic. This one's simple. All you're doing is throwing a grenade and boarding a vehicle at the same time. So for standard controls, it's left trigger and X. This allows you to bypass, for example, the Wraith's lid or shield and kill the enemy inside much quicker. This can also be done on Ghost to instantly kill the driver so he doesn't shoot you while you're driving away. Keep in mind that boarding a Ghost from the back is also faster than boarding it from the front. This is a small thing, but it's important. The last glitch for Metro is on the Scarab. You can literally drop into the eye of the Scarab and see the entire inside room without ever setting foot in there. This is super useful for any type of run as those enemies can't shoot back at you. The next one is more of a trick than anything else, but most people don't know that you can survive three grenades going off at the same time while in a ghost. Look at this segmented strat at the end of Delta Halo. Regret also has a fun little launch. On the final gondola ride, there are two banshees that normally chase you. No, you can't hijack them, but that doesn't mean you can't use them. To get a hold of one, you need to stick the banshee with a grenade. You want the driver dead, but the banshee still intact. And with a little bit of maneuvering, you line up this banshee and shoot one of the wings with a rocket and boom, you're flying straight to Regret's temple. It's nuts. Following that comes a glitch on quarantine zone. By taking the tank out of the map and parking it in a specific spot, you can get the tank past all of the blockage in the Sentinel factory. It's a little hard to reach at first, but here comes the handy super bounce to get you up to it, no problem. And finally comes the great journey. Not only can you get a vehicle into the final boss fight, but you can get a Spectre, a Banshee, or even a Wraith. Yeah, you can fight Tartarus with a Wraith. 
You line up whatever your desired vehicle is on top of one of the unloaded rooms. This unloaded room and the cutscene trigger that activates once you enter the building, it extends out pretty far. With the correct lineup, you hit the load, activate the cutscene, and this will put your vehicle into a kind of limbo falling state while the cutscene is playing. So make sure that you're spamming A to skip it so the Banshee or Wraith or Spectre, whatever, doesn't fall into the void. Once done correctly, you turn around, retreat back to the entrance room, and boom. Easy final boss fight. Halo 2 has so many things to learn and explore. Take these enemy spawns, for example. These are the spawns you probably didn't know existed because if you don't do these specific things, you'll never encounter these enemies. On outskirts, there's a specific set of grunts that will only spawn if you enter through the back of the broken building near Hotel Zanzibar. These grunts don't have any special weapons or anything, but it's a nice touch to add replayability to a timeless classic. Near the end of Delta Halo, there's another wave of drones that spawns inside the temple. They only spawn if both Jackal Snipers are dead without being alerted. You have to get a crazy angle and have ironclad patience to wait for the first Jackal to get in range and then quickly disperse of the second before he realizes his comrade has fallen. This next spawn literally took 10 years for me to figure out. Like I had to go into the game code to break this down. In the underwater section of Regret, after the room with Regret's hologram, there's a camo hallway with two elites and three grunts. You can get another camo elite spawn by dispatching the first elite with a back smack and then quickly headshotting the second. The game checks here for how many elites are alive when the enemies get alerted. If there is less than one elite alive, it spawns another, and that's how you get the fabled camo carbine elite. The next on the list isn't actually a spawn, but it does fit here. On Sacred Icon, when riding the gondola, if you look at the brute corpse laying on the ground, it actually blinks. I think this AI was supposed to be alive and be support for the player here, but he literally just blinks at you. First time I saw this, like, I thought I was seeing shit. I had to, like, zoom in, do a double take, make sure I'm not crazy. I was thinking, like, man, what, what, am, I, what am I looking at right now? What the hell? Anyway, all of the next spawns that are coming up, they're all on Gravemind, and every single one of them is complex. There are up to two extra grunt spawns that you can get in the room with the prison lift before you go down into the prison. How these guys work is dependent on how many brutes are alive when the enemies get alerted. It's not really possible to kill all three brutes on the same frame here, but pretty much if all three of them died at the exact same time, during the reinforcements that spawn in, instead of getting only brutes there, you can actually get up to two grunts alongside them for the first wave of reinforcement. And then the second wave that's in the back of the room can also have two grunts spawn with that brute. Following this, the next spawn set is actually in the same area, but it's after you leave the prison. It's like on that lower section. There's an extra wave of drones here that actually killed one of my runs during the moist challenge. Once the exit door is triggered, three elites spawn in as well as a wave of drones in the back of the hall. The way the extra drone wave spawns here is if the third drone from the last in the line dies when the exit door is shut. Yes, I realize how stupid this sounds. How do you think I feel? Once again, I had this looked into by game code. I can't imagine what Bungie devs were thinking here other than, yeah, these players can eat shit. Woo! Woo! Let's go! Woo! Okay, these are the things, though, that make this game great. But seriously, what the hell? Anyway... Then, following that spawn is also another wave of drones, but this one is in Hell Room, right after the second light bridge. Most of the time in this room, you would encounter an extra wave of elites that spawn. It's, you know, the two jetpackers, the honor guard carbine guy. Uh, anyway, if you can somehow manage to kill all of the drones without any of the elites dying, you can get the secret extra wave of drones here. As far as I know, there isn't a way to get both of them to spawn, but considering that, you know, one relies on the other, like, in order to get drones, you know, all the drones have to die, in order to get elites, all the elites have to die, I guess it kind of makes sense that you can't get both of them. Either way, I consider this just another good Easter egg to make each and every run a little bit different. 
I hope you're ready, because here comes some AI glitches. One of the most famous AI glitches is duplicating specific allies. The one most known for Halo 2 is, of course, Sergeant Johnson, and actually on both the first and the last levels. When playing Lasso, if you use a sword and melee Johnson from the beginning of the mission all the way through to the space section, instead of despawning him, the game just plops another one down. It's funny, you can literally take him all the way to the end of the mission too. How he breathes in space though, no one knows. The other Johnson glitch is on the final mission, The Great Journey. You have to use the specter from the beginning of the mission and take it all the way to a glitched location and drop it into a load zone while a cutscene activates. The specter here is very, very specific. It has to be the one from the mission start. Something about carrying it across certain load zones is what makes this glitch work. This is in my top five for H2 glitches because you can literally spawn as many Johnsons as you want. Although if you spawn too many, eventually you'll despawn Tartarus. So yeah, let's not do that. And speaking of infinite AI, on Quarantine Zone, there are actually a couple of locations where infinite enemies will spawn forever. What's cool here is that if you only kill the ghost driver and leave the ghost intact, you can stack up so many that you can despawn the pelican that carries the scorpion overhead in the next area. Wild. Now to cover Invincible AI. The only other Invincible AI worth mentioning is Halfjaw. In any situation where he is in combat with the Flood and he drops to no shield, if a popcorn flood lands on him enough times, he'll be launched into the sky. Now I'm not sure why this happens, but that doesn't mean that I'm not gonna love it. Hearing his AI go, and then he just plummets in from outer space, <laughs> never gets old. Okay, okay, Tartarus isn't actually invincible either. Okay, he is when his shield is up, but that's not the point here. I found a glitch I had never seen before that completely broke his AI, and I've never been able to repeat it. This is one of the few where I actually have no idea what happened, but he was stuck in a jumping animation the entire fight. Okay, it's just easier if I roll the clip. Here. What? He's just, he's like fucking confused. <laughs> oh my God, get a life, dude. Why is he jumping off the edge? No way, this is not real. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! Well, that's going in the next WTF compilation. <laughs> the final topic before I close things out the broken melees of AI. There's a double hit glitch that happens with Berserking Brutes as well as a couple of different types of standard elites. There's no science here with the Brutes. During his charging attack, he lifts his head up and then back down. And if you're right in front of that, you'll be hit twice for the instant kill. The heretic elites, they are also very broken. If you stand directly in front of them, they will never damage you. The angle of their melee hitbox is actually angled instead of straight on. So they are more likely to kill you if you try to step out of the way. The best way to deal with them is to close the gap with a sword out and melee them right back. The flood, the mother, Blood. These guys have an insanely broken hitbox range. How big it actually is, I don't know. But if they are standing in front of you and they do this stupid circus act idiot melee, it almost feels undodgeable. It's basically Inspector Gadget, but he died and came back as a parasite. And then we have Sword Elites. Most people run in fear from Sword Elites. Well, I'm here to give you the ace in the hole. On the left-hand side of any Sword Elite, if you sidestep and rotate your character model to just wrap around them, the sword will hit you, but it won't actually kill you. There's not much more to this. It's scary to do, but with enough practice, this is a game changer in close quarters. What, you thought the video was over? Come on, man. I saved the best glitch for last. Arbitrary Unit Possession, or AUP for short. What this is, 
is you can take control of any biped in the entire game without using mods. Now, I know that sounds crazy. I know it sounds like I'm making it up, blah, blah, blah. How you do this is you manipulate the game code and you're effectively taking control of an enemy that is in another load zone that hasn't been spawned in yet. Now, a lot of things go into this. A lot of different things matter. How many times you shoot, how many grenades are thrown, how many dead bodies are on the ground, how many allies are alive, how many boxes, crates, explosions, everything that you can think of that is in the game code matters for this to work. And it's absolutely insane. The best example of this is on outskirts, right at the very beginning of the mission, you do a specific set of steps and then you walk into another load zone and you can spawn in your teammate as a phantom. Now, I need to say that this glitch only works in co-op. It requires two players, one to be alive and one to be dead. And basically the first step that you're going to want to do is you want to do the correct number of grenade throws, explosions, shooting, bodies on the ground. It's different for every one that you're trying to do. But for this specific one, you need to shoot two times, block all of your allies from killing a grunt because that grunt dying could drop grenades and that would change things. But anyway, you wanna shoot two times, block the door so your teammates can't run into the very first area of outskirts, and then your teammate needs to die. What you do then is you run back into a glitch spot. I guess it's not really a glitch spot, but what it is is it's a, a position on the map where whenever your teammate is trying to spawn in, the game thinks that there's not enough room to put them on the map. So you know how like on, on easy mode, normal, whatever, uh, whenever your teammate dies, it says in the, you know, in the death cam mode, it'll say in the top left hand corner, uh, teammate moving too fast or teammate in motion or teammate in combat or whatever. Where this glitch comes into play is the person that's alive needs to be in a spot standing there or, or crouched in, in most situations where the game is trying to spawn them in, but it thinks that there's not enough room. And so after you do that, you restart the mission or revert to last checkpoint. And whenever that happens, the game thinks it's still trying to spawn in the second player, even though whenever you reverted the checkpoint, now they're back alive. So what you do is you repeat the process, you shoot twice, go into the room, scare the grunt away. You have to make sure that none of your teammates shoot and that your partner dies the exact same way that they died the first time using just the two grenades because the SMG on the ground, the B on the R on the ground, the body on the ground, all of those things matter. Anyway, once you get all of that done, you start meleeing to delay your partner's spawn and you run forward into the next load zone. Now you have to hide from the other enemies. You don't want them to shoot you because again, shooting makes a difference. And after about three to five seconds of delaying your partner spawn, you'll start to hear the phantom come in overhead. You allow your teammate to spawn and he will spawn in as a phantom. Absolutely mind breaking. Now, if you've watched the video up to this point, thank you so much for taking the time. I know this was a bit of a longer one, but Halo 2 is the one that I know the most. It's I'm the most in depth of all of the tricks and stuff. And I wanna thank you so much for, again, taking the time, watching the video all the way through. If you enjoyed this, if you learned anything new, if you wanna see more, let me know in the comments. Thank you guys so much, and I'll see you on the next one.